Then Solomon sent to Hiram king of Tyre, saying, As you have dealt with David my father and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the set feasts of the Lord our God. This is an ordinance forever to Israel. And the temple which I build will be great, for our God is greater than all gods. But who is able to build him a temple, since heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build him a temple except to burn sacrifice before him? Therefore, send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver, in bronze and iron, in purple and crimson and blue, who has skill to engrave with the skillful men who are with me in Judah and Jerusalem, whom David my father provided. Also send me cedar and cypress and algum logs from Lebanon, for I know that your servants have skill to cut timber in Lebanon. And indeed, my servants will be with your servants to prepare timber for for me in abundance. For the temple which I am about to build shall be great and wonderful. And indeed, I will give to your servants the woodsmen who cut timber, 20,000 cores of ground wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Then Hiram king of Tyre answered in writing, which he sent to Solomon, because, because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Hiram also said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and earth, for he has given King David a wise son, endowed with prudence and understanding, who will build a temple for the Lord and a royal house for himself. And now I have sent a skillful man, endowed with understanding, Huram, my master craftsman, the son of a woman of the daughter's of Dan and his father was a man of Tyre, skilled to work in gold and silver, bronze and iron, stone and wood, purple and blue, fine linen and crimson, and to make any engraving and to accomplish any plan which may be given to him with your skillful men and with the skillful men of my Lord David, your father. And we'll stop there. So I wanted to read that just so you can see uh, how Solomon went about this. And he specifically is interacting with Hiram, king of Tyre. And Solomon, he wants to build a, a, a great building. And I actually have an artist's conception of the building you see here. And, you know, uh, I wish we could see it. I wish we could actually see what it was like. And, and as we go through here, we're going to see some more descriptions of this. But you get an idea just based on uh, the beginning materials that he's gathering and the workforce that he's gathering, uh, that this is not some sort of a flimsy construct. Uh, there's a lot of thought and effort being put into this. But the first thing is getting the right people for the right job. And that is so important. As Solomon is going to build, he builds it, First of all, with skill. That's the first point here, that the temple is built with skill. It's the right people doing the right work. And I mentioned this this morning, just in reference to how God said no to David because he was the king that was fighting the battles and really laying the groundwork for the kingdom in many ways. And Solomon was a man of peace and wisdom. Uh, So God had different plans for each of those kings But as we see the temple being built, there were different skills that were involved. And I'd like us to think tonight about how that's still true today, that we're the body of Christ. And each member has been gifted by God. He didn't put a bunch of the same gifts together, did he? And uh, uh, when I read this, again, uh, uh, Hiram is uh, this man who can work with all of these different materials and that is amazing. Uh, I can't do that. Uh, and so I really admire that. And I think today, you know, we have all kinds of artistic works, like movies that are made. But someone who has a great vision for a movie, and some of you, you've, you've watched great films, and some of them are biblical films, like The Ten Commandments. Someone like Cecil B. DeMille, who was a great director, he may have had vision for what he wanted to put in the film, 
But you have to have people that can really do that artistic work to make it look realistic and to really uh, put you into that world. And I, what Solomon is building here, it does involve artistic work. So what are the skills that God has given us? And I actually want us to answer this question right now. You're allowed to talk now. Uh, what are the skills that he has given right within this room here? It can be any skill, but what are the things that we're all differently gifted by God to do? Very good. We may not be able to sing the Hallelujah Chorus, but, but, but we definitely have singers, and we definitely have uh, gifts in that area. And, and again, with that, uh, God gave us different voices with different uh, ranges and different tones. And you can think about how that uh, just adds so much to our music. So that's a good one. What else? Okay, you guys like the music thing. Yes, absolutely. And that is good. We have uh, the ability to play instruments, uh, which takes ability as well as uh, a lot of practice to be able to play those. Teaching, right. And we have various teachers, uh, which is one reason I think God uh, called us to start a school. <laughs> and, and we've continued to uh, have teachers drawn into this ministry uh, because we have, we have school and we love to teach. And even during our church times, we love to teach. So a lot of teachers. Anything else? Sewing. Sewing. All right. Now that's something I am not gifted at, but uh, that's a good one. Encouraging. Encouraging. That is a good gift. What else? Very good. I love hearing these because um, sometimes we, we, they're just there, you know, encouraging. I mean, that's a gift. Some people, when you're with them, they really help you because they have that gift of encouraging. And carpentry, uh, we really, really need people who are good with their hands in that way. Very important. Giving. giving, the gift of giving, which is great because that generosity helps so much with God's work and with helping people. Hospitality. And hospitality, very good. That's great. And, uh, you know, think too about how we glorify God. And that's one of the ex reasons for this exercise is how we glorify God individually and collectively. And individually, uh, if you have the gift of hospitality, you have the ability to host people. You have the ability maybe at times even to bring someone uh, into your home who's, who's in need and, and show hospitality that way. But collectively too, the gift of hospitality and all these other gifts you're talking about operate among us because if someone comes into our church, we need people with the gift of hospitality who actually think about what does it feel like to come into this church. And, uh, you know, th this morning the, a visitor came and uh, you, you could just tell, and, and she was actually talking to me, uh, didn't know where to go, Right? And it's really uh, just unsettling, kind of awkward to step into a new place. So that's why that gift of hospitality among us is so important. And uh, just people that are friendly, as well as people who give thought to what it would be like to, to come into our presence. So that's a good one. Yeah, the gift of evangelism. And that's a very important one. And um, what, what's so great about all these gifts, I and mean, we could go on and on with them, but it's realizing that uh, you don't have all of them, do you? <laughs> As we're naming some of these, you're going, ah, I don't have that. But also realizing that your gift is important. And I say that, that, that I really believe that with all my heart because I... I always think it's, um, well, I think even in the Bible, 
there were always gifts that were more noticeable. But that doesn't make them superior. Because it's just like Paul said, if all you have is an eye, where's the hearing? Right? It's, it's, you have to have all the parts of the body. So, the temple is built with skill. We have to have the right people doing the right things. And when it comes to even to ministry today in our own lives and the way we glorify God, whether it's here or even if it's at our work or if it's in our home, we have to thank God for giving us different gifts and we need to use those gifts, use the skills that he's given us. And uh, we need to be careful because as humans, there's all kinds of errors we can make. And one of them is to, you know, sometimes overextend ourselves, right? And say, I need to be doing everything. And in reality, we can be thinking about what are the primary things. Not that we, we by the way, you know, we, we never want to say, I don't have the gift of mercy, therefore I don't have to be merciful, or I don't have the gift of giving, therefore I don't have to give. However, if you do have a gift to realize, wow, that is something I need to use for God. And then also to, to really, as I personally make that effort, then also to be cooperative with other people and uh, allow other people to serve in those ways. So it's really just that, that wonderful picture but that allows us to, to do what God has called us to do with skill, which leads to the next point here. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 3, this is the foundation which Solomon laid for the building of the house of God. The length was 60 cubits by cubits according to the former measure and the width 20 cubits. And the vestibule that was in the front of the sanctuary was 20 cubits long across the width of the house, and the height was 120, and he overlaid the inside with pure gold. The larger room he paneled with cypress, which he overlaid with fine gold, and he carved palm trees and chain work on it, and he decorated the house with precious stones for beauty, and the gold was gold from Paravaim. He also overlaid the house, the beams and doorposts, its walls and doors with gold, and he carved cherubim on the walls. And then if you go over to chapter 4, verse 19, Solomon had all the furnishings made for the house of God, the altar of gold, the tables on which was the showbread, the lampstands with their lamps of pure gold to burn in the prescribed manner, in front of the inner sanctuary with the flowers and the lamps and the wick trimmers of gold, of purest gold, the trimmers, the bowls, the ladles, the censers of pure gold. As for the entry of the sanctuary, its inner doors to the most holy place and the doors of the main hall of the temple were gold. I think you see a theme here. Uh, there's a lot of gold, but this isn't gold color. <laughs> this is actual gold. As I mentioned this morning, uh, he spent, there was a lot of money in preparing for this. It was gold, gold, right? But there was more than just gold. There was fabric too, beautiful fabric, and silver being used as we heard this morning. So why? Why would you have these precious metals being used? Yes, for expense, for, for elaborateness, but why, what is one of the reasons we really like those metals? Why is it? Yeah, it, it's, it really has a beauty to it. It, it. It's something that is expensive, but it's also something that is beautiful. So the point here is that the, the temple was built with beautiful work. I wish that we could actually see it. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we sell people of the past short. I don't know why, you know, but we, we think we're so great at making things today, and we can make some pretty impressive things. But we get glimpses of what people have made in the past. And I do, uh, I right now teaching like church music history, and again, we might think, oh, we make great music today, we, you know, we have, but you know, you go back hundreds of years, uh, and, and many years ago, they still had amazing ability to, to, to do music. And the same with building. 
and artwork. And some of the great artwork is from, from hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And the same with the, this building. You can just imagine, though, it was beautiful. So why do that? Why make something so beautiful? Well, it's a temple. And it is going to be for people to come and to worship. And I love Solomon. He, what we read today, this morning, he knew God doesn't true. He's not confined to a temple. The glory of the Lord is throughout the earth, and, and the, heavens of, the heaven of heavens cannot contain him, he says. But this place would be a place that would glorify God, and so he makes it as beautiful as he can because it is for God's glory. So I want you to think about that. Why is it important to do things well? The way that with the quality that we see here. Why is it important to do things well when it comes to the way that we glorify God? Why is it important to do things well? And now you're allowed to answer again. Okay. What, what is it about that that, that honors him? What do you think? That's a good point. Uh, how do we see God doing things beautifully? Can you think of any examples? What? It was good. And even though sin has marred this creation, there's still so much we can look at today and see that God's original design was good. It is beautiful. I, I love, by the way, I, I, I kind of feel like I have to mention it, but I, I hear Richard Dawkins, he's an he's a adamant atheist. But every once in a while, I'll hear him talk, and he'll say the same thing. When I look at the universe, it does stir up a sense of worship. I know, ironic. But you can't help it. It's so amazing. So yes, it reflects God himself. And we're made in His image, so I think we have the impulse. I'm kind of contrasting here, though, with, and I think because of this, the sin aspect of the world, we, we don't always do things well, do we? It's possible to, to give less than our best. But when God does things, He does such amazing work. And when we're doing things to our best... It's wonderful. So why does that glorify God more? Why is it important to do things well? Can you think of any other reasons? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so from our standpoint, when I'm saying I'm doing this uh, with all my might because I'm doing it for the Lord. He's worthy of me giving my best. That's a good point. Yep. What else? Yeah, so when, when people look at us, the, the way we do things reflects on our Lord. Yep. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, another example, another example of how he, this is a, the character of God to give, and he gave Christ us. So yes, our response to him. Have you, what are some things, if you just allow your mind to kind of think about this, that you've seen done well, or that maybe you yourself have done really well? Have you, have you ever had that experience where you knew, uh, I put a ton of effort into this, and it is my best? And uh, I'll tell you, when you do put that effort in and, uh, and it turns out the way you want it to, which, again, that doesn't always happen, but when it does turn out the way you want it to, sometimes people will look at that. And I think, actually, this is what we see in the building of the temple. When people were looking at this, what do you think they were saying? Oh, that's nice. Pretty nice. Yeah. They were probably like, wow. And when you do what God has given you to do well, there is something that 
It is very satisfying. It does remind us of when God made the world and he said, this is good. But you can experience that even today. People who do their best with things and have great abilities. Uh, and again, going back to, to Handel, when he, when he wrote Messiah, a magnum opus for him. I mean, he was a great writer. But when, uh, when Haydn heard that, that's when he made the comment, when he heard Messiah, that's when Haydn said he is the master of us all. And, and Haydn was, was not like an amateur composer, all right? So it just shows you. And that's the point I'm making is that when we do things well, the first thing that might happen is people go, wow, what you did was amazing. But then when we give God the glory, it points to him. And I think we can see that in so many ways in our lives. And by the way, getting back to our gifts, when you do hospitality well, it glorifies God. Right? When you do whatever it is that God has gifted you to do well, with skill, it glorifies God. I actually... um, you know, I listen to different things, and I've been listening to this man who, who does um, consulting for advertising and things like that. And this is really funny, that with, uh, with the younger generation, uh, as many of you know, uh, they, they, uh, they've had a lot of computers and electronic devices in their lives. So this is kind of interesting. When they get something in print, it's actually more special to them than getting something in in electronic form. Um, Now, that might be true for a lot of us, but I'm even talking about things like mail. A lot of us remember, you know, junk mail, right? And there's still junk mail. But the idea of actually getting something in in the mail for a young person is, is really, really special. It's just not something they've had as much experience with. And so he was encouraging that you can do a lot of things now, do them beautifully with print work. And uh, I think it just shows you that uh, we value certain things because they're done well. Speakers he was talking about who are well prepared, right? When someone gets up to speak... We value that because they actually took the time to prepare what they're saying. So, I want you to think about this. What are things that you can do well in your life? What are some things that you could do well? Or what can we do well uh, in the church to the glory of God? So, again, uh, I'll let you give some input on this. Uh, and this isn't to, to uh, this is to encourage you, you know, and it's just to get us to think a little bit here. So what are some things that we can do well to the glory of God? It's going to be a repetition of some of the things we said before. What do you think, Larry? Very good. Very good. Very good. Yeah, and, and hearing you say that is that principle of uh, what we are in private eventually uh, affects our, our, our public life, right? And so if we're giving God our best in private, it, it will show uh, publicly. Uh, so very good point. Mm. So that we're focusing correctly and using God's word as like the authoritative thing throughout our whole service and service. Yeah. Yes, really, really uh, doing our best when we're thinking about how we run everything here to, to uh, showcase the, the beauty and the importance of the gospel. Yeah, that's a really good point. 
And we're going to get to that kind of at the end because that's really getting into the next point. Uh, and I just want us to all remember that so much of what we do ties in. I mean, we talk about the gift of evangelism. And, you know, I, I don't know if a lot of people think about this, but it's, it's awesome. You know, let me, let me give you an example. Like, uh, who's a great evangelist? Billy Graham, right? But did you know Billy Graham... What, one of the things that he, he did for years, and I know you know this, but, and, and other evangelists did the same thing. He would actually get great musicians to come and be part of his event. And he would do them in places that were large. That was not by mistake. It was all part of saying, hey, let's do this in a way that's going to allow different people to use their gifts, and that's going to really showcase the gospel. Now, in our church here, it's not going to be like a Billy Graham event, is it? But in our own way, we can be thinking, how do our gifts work together to do that? So I really like that. But we'll, we'll get to that, too, at the end there, uh, toward the end. But um, any other things that you can do well with skill or, or to, the, to the best of your ability, to the glory of God. Give. Yes. And, and when it comes to money, that in and of itself is, a, uh, is, is something that is an expression of worship uh, and, and, and great. But... But we can go beyond money, right? Uh, and give, and, and that's where I think that idea of doing our best, because remember in, when uh, one of the problems with Israel, when they were really straying from God, they, were giving, they weren't giving their best animals, right? And they weren't really giving the best that they could to God. So yeah, even thinking about what we give. Um, isn't it awesome and, you know, I think, think here of people that have been involved in different ministries, like the Becks. Um, isn't it awesome when someone uh, gives, not only would they give to, to a place like camp or CF, but actually give something really nice? That actually is not something you always see. And yet it's something that really shows uh, love for the Lord. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's right. So teaching well. And uh, if if you're a teacher, uh, you know I I'm I get to teach too in different settings. Obviously, uh, I just want to encourage you uh, that you know. It really does make a difference, and uh, every every gift that God has given us is important. But I really do see that teaching is something you know with the school and everything. I see uh, really the uh, the effort that's put in. So good job, but we need to to do our best with that. Okay, so. The temple was built with skill, the right people doing the right jobs. The temple was built with beautiful work. It was done well. And then thirdly, this is so important, the temple was built according to God's design. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Then the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place, to the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place under the wings of the cherubim. And verse 11, And it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place, for all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and, J and Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar, clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps, 
and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord, was filled with a cloud so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. What is so cool about this is that God is showing His glory and He is part of, you know, showing His presence in the midst of what they're doing. But you know, it was because of a response to His revelation. Because He said, here is what I want my temple to be. And when he originally gave instruction even to Moses, there was a certain design that God had. And we read a little bit about that here, about this place called the Most Holy Place. And what did they bring into the Most Holy Place? That is so important. The Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is this box And uh, it has in it the tablets of Moses. But what is it that's really signified by that? Are, are, Are the stone tablets what people are to worship? Is the box really something of worship? No. But what that box contained was the covenant. Was this covenant that said, here is how I will relate to my people. Now, what covenant was that? That was the covenant of law, right? And it, it had the stone tablets of law, and you think maybe of the Ten Commandments, which signified and represented the law of God. What's so fascinating about that is that God actually chose Israel out of grace, didn't He? He graciously reached into their life, chose them, you know, worked in their history, and then graciously in that relationship with them gave them the law. But what did the law really show them? That they could never be as holy as God. So the presence of God is a place of holiness and the place of His perfect righteousness, signified by the law, which we could never keep. And I was just watching a special. My parents had it on uh, when I was in New Jersey. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu was giving a tour of the temple area of Jerusalem. And he showed, he went down into a low place underground, and he showed a wall. Uh, Now, this was actually part of Herod's temple, but he said, this is the place that we believe is closest to the most holy place. And even you could tell when he was saying that what reverence uh, he felt when he was talking about that. Because the most holy place signified, represented the closest place to the presence of God. But you know that covenant that God had so that they could be in his presence was only really teaching them and pointing toward another covenant that he would make. I have some verses I'm going to show you here. Jeremiah 33, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the land to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So this shows you how they could not keep His law But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. This new covenant that God would give... First of all, it would be something where the law would be written on the heart and they would desire within their heart to please God. And secondly, it involved the forgiveness of sin. 
How did that happen? Actually, in Matthew 26, many of us know this because it, when we talk about the Lord's Supper, we read these verses. It says, as they were eating, before Jesus died, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you for this is my blood of what? The new covenant. How was the new covenant given to us? Through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For the forgiveness of our sin and for the writing of his law on our hearts. And then he said, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And we can be part of that kingdom and part of that covenant through Jesus Christ. So the temple by doing things according to God's design, it brought glory to God. His glory was revealed there, but it was through the covenant. And it was a pointer to the gospel. It was a pointer to the new covenant. The temple ultimately pointed to Jesus. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, and you would expect the book of Hebrews to clear this up for us, because he's talking to Jews who are Christians, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter what? The holy place, the holies, the, the, the most holy place, the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, because the temple had the veil separating them from the presence of God. But we can go through that veil, which is through the flesh of Jesus, through his body, and having a high priest over the house of God, that's referring to Jesus, let us draw near to the presence of God, that most holy place that Benjamin, not yet, I can't even say his name right now, but he said is supposedly behind this wall, but we can go right to the presence of God himself. With full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. What that's saying is Jesus has paid it all. He is the perfect sacrifice and we can enter into God's presence. That's the gospel. That is good news that we can have that relationship with God, have His law in our hearts and have that knowledge of God. So, my final question tonight is, since the temple was really pointing to Jesus and the gospel, what is it that we do that points to the gospel? Because what we do at church, and Jens was kind of hitting on this, needs to be according to God's design. We don't do church the way we feel like it, ultimately. We do church in a way that is following what God wants His message, what, what God wants to show forth as His message to the world. So there are actually a lot of things that we do that point to the gospel and the new covenant. But um, what are some things that come to your mind that we do that point to the gospel? That's a good one since we just read it. <laughs> when we gather, one of the things that we do is we have communion and we actually eat of the bread and drink of the cup and it reminds us of the Lord's death and the blood of the new covenant. That's an excellent one. And what's another one that kind of goes along with that? Baptism. How is that pointing to the gospel? <coughs> Buried with him in his death, and raised with him in life. Very good. Anything else? That uh, points to the gospel in our lives? Yeah, the worship, the music, those songs that we sing. They're, they're often hitting on many different kinds of gospel themes. The what was that? The and yes, the preaching of the word. 
Lord willing, is going to be giving the gospel. It's what it ought to be doing. That's right, and the teaching should do this. Another one, whether you, whether you thought of this or not, I just want to remind you of it at least, is the Bible says that marriage points to the gospel, right? And our families. Because of that relationship that God has designed, that reminds us of his relationship to his people and the blessings of that relationship. And our witness, our witness is how we point to the gospel. And I want to remind us all of that as we uh, have been talking a lot about Sunday nights, reaching out to people that God has placed in our lives, that we are to be glorifying God through our witness. So with all of this to kind of wrap up here, there's, a, there's an individual element and a collective element. And individually, we are glorifying God with our skills, with sharing the gospel, with living out the lives he's called us to live. But you know what? It's not just individual, it's collective. He didn't just say, I will build individuals. He said, I will build my church. And that's intentional. So we want to continue to pray that just like when we read this and we say, that's great, look at what God did through uh, Solomon and he built this beautiful thing and he revealed his glory, but we now are the temple of God. Let's pray that God will show his glory through us and that we will continue to seek him for how he wants to use the way that he has gifted us and the way that he has put us together so that the world can see who Jesus is. All right, we have a closing song. Why don't you uh, come up and lead us in that?